Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, my first time speaking to an audience in the Ukraine, my first time in Kiev, which is great because Kiev's beautiful and also because it gives me the opportunity to recycle an old story. Uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and my son, small boy, were out in town in Brussels where we live shopping. And uh, suddenly my son, very excited by something, he's pointing, look, look, beautiful, look, look. So my wife turns, <clears throat> and what he's looking at is this enormous poster on a big wall in the city of a beautiful woman in a bikini. She's looking down at this small boy, <laughs> surprised and maybe even a little disappointed to see that he's quite so excited about this bikini. So she says to him, what is it? What, what do you like so much? You know what he said? Swimming pool. Now there's a reason I told you that, and I'll come back to it in just a moment. In the meantime, if I can make this work, that's me in 2014. I don't know how well you can see the picture, but I am a very unhappy man, very unhappy. And that was a discussion with policymakers in the European Union about the future of energy policy up until the year 2030. And that's very angry me, and that's very frustrated European Commission, and we're not happy with each other at all. Now, I talked about my son. I should say something about my daughter. She's half the reason I was so unhappy. I had spent the night before listening to her cry and not sleep and cry and not sleep. So I should be honest and say that's at least half the reason I looked so unhappy, but it's only half. The other reason is this. Just a moment prior to that photo being taken, we had been discussing the European Commission's vision for energy in Europe up to 2030. And in this discussion, I had made the point that the paper they wrote on the subject made 25 references to electricity and did not use the word heat one single time. <laughs> yeah. I spent most of 2014 looking that way. And why was I so frustrated about it? What's the big deal if we don't talk about heat? Well, the big deal is this. Okay? In Europe today, heating and cooling account for more than 50% of the energy that we use. So if you want to talk about plans for an energy transition, if you want to talk about sustainable energy, you'd better be talking about heating and cooling, because if not, there's a major credibility problem and a major execution problem in the end. Now that's important, because we are at the moment engaged in a discussion about what we call the European energy transition. Now, I have spent the last 10 years in discussions over policy frameworks up to the year 2020, policy frameworks up to the year 2030, policies to promote renewable energy, policies, policies to promote energy efficiency. It's great. But in the end, those are nothing but incremental milestones. The real story is here, 2050. And what every sane person seems to agree is that by 2050, we need to have decarbonized our energy system. Now, maybe there's a tiny bit of greenhouse gas left in heavy industry or certain aspects of agriculture. I don't know what. What I can tell you is that for the building sector, the places where we live and work and sleep and eat, we need to have phased out CO2 emissions by 2050 at the absolute latest. And that is nothing short of a revolution. Because today, we heat and cool our buildings all across Europe and around the world, typically in a highly carbon-intensive manner. And my adopted hometown of Brussels is no exception. Nice street, nice buildings. What do you see upstairs? Chimney, 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 chimney. What does that mean downstairs? Gas boiler, oil boiler, gas boiler, oil boiler. I'm in the process of renovating a house. 
I asked my installer a couple of weeks ago, what if I want to do something more sustainable than an oil or gas boiler? What are my options? The look he gave me was the one I had on my face in that picture a few slides ago. So we have a very serious change to make, and we have very little time to do it. 2050 used to sound like science fiction when I started working. Now it sounds like the day after tomorrow. In planning and infrastructure terms, it's no time at all, and we need to change everything. So we can't go quickly enough right now. I grew up in a small village. I love the countryside. But as various people have already made clear today, when it comes to this, when it comes to our climate and energy challenge, it's the city that matters. This is where the people are, this is where the emissions are, this is where the density and the opportunity to do things at a scale that will really make a difference is present. So it's all about what we do with our cities. So two big problems. Sustainable heating and cooling. Sustainable heating and cooling in our cities. And I'm pretty sure that finding ways to meet that challenge is going to be the massive transformative purpose of my little career, and for so many other people too. This is a problem worth getting out of bed for. It's not as cool as a Tesla, it's not a rocket to the moon, but if we don't solve this problem, you forget about the rest of it. We cannot have plans to deal with climate change, we cannot have plans to make our energy system safer and more secure if we don't tackle this problem. And I promise you, it's worth getting out of bed for. So if we want to think about heating and cooling our cities, we better think about what our cities are going to be like in the future. And the screen's blank because it's kind of up to us. Now, when you ask people or when we think about the future of the city, you tend to get one of two different visions. And if you think about depictions of future cities on TV and in the movies, they generally fall into two different camps. This is one of them this dystopian urban nightmare where it's always raining for some reason. I watched Blade Runner in the plane on the way over here. It's amazing how dark these places can be, and it's amazing how often this kind of image comes up when we set our cities in the future. So that's one type of thing. The other one is this, and we've all seen this. The Star Trek city where everything's fine and a flying plane brings you your breakfast in the morning and so on. It's great, and why not? And why not imagine how things might be in 300 years, but somehow, I'm not sure we have that luxury. And these two very different images have something in common. And that is the fact that they are so exotic and foreign and different and strange that I think they allow us to kind of imagine that it's out of our control. The future is distant, and different and strange. And it's just something that's going to happen to us. And that may be a comforting idea, but I think it's also an irresponsible one because the truth is, it's the decisions that we make now, not in 20 years, not in 50 years, but now, that will determine the type of environment that we leave for our kids. And frankly, if I look at the state of the pension system, I'm still probably gonna be working when this comes up. So I have a very direct interest in seeing that we do something about it. Yeah, and this, for some reason. We may disagree about what type of a city we're going to live in, but we seem to have a very robust consensus that we're going to be more or less dressed like this. This is Kiev in 2018. And if I had to guess, I'd say this is also something like Kiev's going to look like in 2050. Of course, things will change. Of course, the city will evolve. But the buildings that are here today are the buildings that we're going to be living and working in in 2050. So we need to find ways to heat and cool those buildings in a manner that is consistent with our society's objectives. Now, whether it's climate change that drives you, whether it's energy security that drives you, whether you're worried about costs in the economy, it doesn't really matter. One way or another, we need to find a way to bring all those things together and heat and cool our buildings in a way that works for us and allows us to meet our goals. 
That brings me to my pet subject, district heating. I'm really into this idea of falling in love with a problem at the moment. And what I mean by that is let's try and think about the problem and not the solution. It's dangerous in a job like mine. It's too easy to start thinking that whatever technology you represent is the answer to every question. It's so easy for me to start every sentence with, isn't district heating wonderful? The truth is, it's not always wonderful. Now, <laughs> some Photoshop has been done on this to make it even worse. <laughs> but initially, I got this picture by Googling district heating and depressing. We've all seen cases like this. District heating, which is built on burning coal. District heating that's been poorly designed. District heating in which you need to open up the windows in the winter to cool down your building. That's not a solution to anybody's problem, and that's not something we should be asking other people to be enthusiastic about. We've all seen stuff like this before, too. There might even be some of it here in this part of the world. And it does no good at all for me to stand here and pretend that it's a good idea or that this is what we need. What I'd like to do is suggest to you that there is another way, there is something else. <laughs> so somebody actually made this chocolate pizza. And the reason it's here is because I was thinking recently that there are things in life that are good even when they're not great. And both chocolate and pizza belong in that category for me. I don't know anything about chocolate pizza. And by the way, as I have an extra minute, I told that story, or I said that to my dentist a few weeks ago, and he's working on my teeth, and I said this stuff about chocolate and pizza, and you'll understand why I said it in a minute. And he got really quiet, and I thought he had lost interest, so I just shut up and let him work on my teeth, and suddenly he said, sex is like that too. Neither one of us spoke for 10 full minutes after that. And I need a new dentist, by the way, if, if anyone knows one. But the point is, the point is, when district heating's not good, well, it's not good. But when it's done properly, it can be something like this. Now, I look at this picture, and before I even see the district heating network, I see a community. And it could be any community around Europe and indeed around the world, all our communities are surrounded by the resources that we need to heat and cool our buildings. As Lars said a few minutes ago, waste heat from our data centers, waste heat from our factories, biomass, solar thermal, wind, using a district heating network to link the thermal and electric grids. All this stuff is available to us in our communities. And instead, for the most part, in Europe and largely around the world, we have this curious habit of heating our buildings by going out onto the other side of the world, digging up some oil or some gas, bringing it back here and burning it. Instead of using the resources and the creativity that exists right here in our own communities. And that's all the district heating network is in the end. It's pipes and it's water. But done properly, it's a wonderfully elegant solution, an extremely efficient tool for bringing a resource from where it is into our buildings where we need it. And when you think about district heating, don't think about that Photoshop mess I showed you a couple minutes ago. Think about this, because this is what it can be in Copenhagen, in Brussels, and here in Kiev. To summarize that, if district heating is going to be good, it needs to be four things. First of all, it needs to be decarbonized. I hope the debate about that is over. It's going to take time. We still have plenty of coal out there. We still have plenty of gas. But over the next 25 years or so, all that needs to go. And there's no reason why it can't be done. It needs to be efficient. Lower temperatures in our networks, better designed systems. Systems that are compatible with the increasingly energy efficient building stock that we need. That's an important point. There is no choice to be made between designing better buildings and using heat networks. We need to do them both together. This is a difficult one for us, customer friendly. 
I think for a long time, this business has been driven by the idea of selling as much heat to as many people as possible. That way of thinking is over. Today, we are in the business of selling a service. Maybe we need to sell a lot less heat to more people. Either way, we need to deliver people an experience that improves their lives. This cannot just be about selling kilowatt hours. It's not enough. And finally, digital. A few minutes ago, Lars was holding up an iPhone. People expect this now. People want this. We need to make this easier for people. We need to engage people and make working with these systems a pleasure and not a burden. And I promise you, it can be done. Now, speaking of engaging people, I first got involved with this industry, God, seven years ago. I went to work for a company, a great company, that is in the business of providing and designing the equipment for these networks. And I sat down with an engineer and asked him to tell me a little bit more about it because I knew nothing at the time. And I asked him to tell me in a way that I could then use to explain to politicians and end users. And within two minutes, he had drawn this. I bet there are some engineers in the room. You love this, don't you? And when I complained that it wasn't really the kind of thing I needed, he did that. It's worse. Engineering's not enough. We have to find ways to engage people. This energy transition needs to be participatory. We cannot impose it on people. They won't put up with it. And by the way, who could get excited about that? Now, this is a map in my adopted home country of Belgium showing Brussels, my home, and Antwerp, 40 kilometers away. There is enough waste heat in Antwerp to heat the entire one million inhabitant city of Brussels. Guess how much of that waste heat is picked up right now and transported from Antwerp to Brussels? Nothing. And in the meantime, we are burning hilarious quantities of oil and gas. Why don't we do it? I keep being told that it's complicated, there are lots of things to arrange, lots of different parties involved. You know what I think is complicated? Because this is what we do now. We build pipelines under the Caspian Sea. I cannot believe that this is easier than that. It doesn't go backwards, but you see my point. We've just got to get better at this. We've got to get bolder. We've got to get more aggressive. We've got to get faster. There is no time. Yeah. OK. Closing words. I just heard something the other day, and I needed to find a way to work this in. There is a guy in Spain who has repeatedly been thrown out of the FNAC bookstore because he keeps going around and writing little notes about what happens at the end of books and putting them in the books. <laughs> now, first of all, let's just take a moment to pause and wonder at the fact that such a person exists and that he has time for that. But also, it just got me thinking about how all of us could write a little note about what's going to happen at the end of our story. We're 30 years away from this now. My horizon is not the end of the century, it's 30 years. And where are we going to be with this massive transformative challenge I've been talking to you about, heating and cooling our buildings in a way that makes sense? Truth is, I don't know. I'm an optimist by nature, but I don't know. What I do know for sure is that it's up to us. Me and so many of you in this room, in Europe and around the world, if we want to, if we want it badly enough, if we take seriously enough the scale and the importance of the challenge, this can be done. And I would like to think that our sector, our technology, and our people can help move us along the way. Thank you very much.